Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. There's many blessings that we receive. For some of us, it's the ability to play a sport, cover a sport, or just be around it. All of us are called to share the gospel, regardless of the role, in our own words, actions, and deeds. There are people out there that are able to do both, and they're unashamed about the way that God is using them. And these are the people that can inspire us to do the very same in our own lives. Welcome to Faith on the Field. Welcome to the Power and Light podcast, and today we have the second episode of our new series called Faith on the Field. I'd like to welcome to the show former American Ninja Warrior, but also founder and head trainer for Ignite Your Game, Lars Hansen. Lars, welcome to the show. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Looking forward to this. So first off, what is Ignite Your Game and what is the purpose behind it? Yeah, so essentially what I do is uh, I coach athletes to run faster, jump higher, get stronger for sports, um, basically just overall kind of to like improve their athletic performance. So why is teaching youth for you, whether it's ac academically, but mainly in this sports athletics type, why is that so important for you? Yeah, uh, a huge reason why it's so important for me is because I was actually cut from a basketball team for lacking speed, strength, and stamina as a young fourth grade kid. And uh, yeah, if you've ever suffered that kind of rejection uh, in anything, uh, whether it's sports or girlfriend or something like that, you know, like, man, that kind of rejection just hurts. And so, um, yeah, I definitely have an, a heart of empathy for people who struggle with that. Uh, but also there's people who are naturally really gifted in those things that still are hungry to get better. And so regardless of where someone's at on that spectrum, whether they're just like, I want to make my high school team or, you know, I want to get a D1 scholarship offer or try to go pro, um, I work with a little bit of everything. And my hope, it's basically the same formula for all of those things, uh, wherever you're at. You got to get stronger, learn how to produce those forces quicker. And I feel like we've kind of cracked the code on it. Uh, I got to see some of that fruit in my own life and I feel like I'm a much better coach now than I am, uh, you know, than I was as an athlete. And so it's fun for me to be able to kind of help pay that forward to the next gener generation of athletes uh, now to this day. So you mentioned those three pillars that you said that were the issues that you had, the things that you wanted to improve. Why choose those three things to help other athletes improve? Uh, can you say that one more time? I think it cut out there just a little bit. You're good. So the three pillars that you mentioned there, the speed, the jumping and the other... Why are those three so important for developing athletes as youth? Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, honestly, I think that those are just some of the most important athletic abilities outside of the actual skills. Um, obviously, if you're a baseball player, you need to be able to swing your bat. You need to be able to, you know, catch and throw and things like that. If you're a basketball player, you got to be able to shoot the ball. Um, but outside of like those tangible skills, I really think that your actual athleticism is probably one of the most important things. And uh, those attributes are also universal. Like almost every sport, you need to be fast. Almost every sport, you need to be agile. Almost every sport, you know, you need to be strong. And obviously there's some that maybe it's not as important. But uh, for the most part, if you build those things, if you fill those buckets, you can compete in any sport and do really well. So how much do you highlight effort in the sense of, how much effort you put forward is how much you're going to get back. Is that something that you highlight in your gym? And what does that look like? Yeah, great question. Um, effort's super important. Um, I have also found that like it is possible to overdo it. There are athletes where it's like the reason why their growth is hindered is because they try to go too hard, too quick. They don't get enough rest. Their bodies don't get enough rest because they're constantly competing in sports all the time. And like a huge thing about actually improving your sprint speed or vertical jump is it's quality over quantity. Um, and so that's a little bit of a different spin on your question, but it's kind of important to address like what is effort. You know, for me, effort is giving like maximum intensity, but it's also having the discipline to eat well, drink well, sleep well, do all those little things as well. There's a lot of things that take there's a lot of things that have to happen for you to get good at something. And I think it's great that you're breaking it down and then helping people through their journey. Now, your athletic journey 
and your faith journey, they kind of intertwine in some ways. Can you just kind of give me the journey of your life and explain why and how, I guess, how did it lead to creating this business? Yeah, absolutely, man. That's a great question. I'll start with the business side of things and then kind of go into the faith stuff from there. So when I was in fourth grade, I was cut from a basketball team for lacking speed, strength, and stamina, as I mentioned. Uh, and that's really what kind of lit the fire underneath me to want to get better. Uh, and so I started running on my own, started doing strength training, um, eventually started getting coached by some pretty world-class strength trainers and speed and agility, like strength coaches. Um, and uh, that really set me up for success doing that like for a short season as a, as a young kid gave me a really big leg up. So by the time I hit like middle school track, I still had in my head that I was like slow and lack stamina and those kind of things. Um, but then like when I started doing track to continue to work on work to continue working on those weaknesses, I started to see all that hard work start to pay off. And it was, it was really cool and really rewarding, really kind of like reignited the fire to keep doing what I was doing. Um, and so when I was in sixth grade is when I started coaching my younger brother through a lot of the stuff that I had been learning, basically just taking the same workouts that I had done and relaying them to him. And then as he started getting faster, stronger, more agile, his friends and teammates started inquiring and things like that. And so I was in seventh grade and started a youth speed and agility camp in my parents' backyard. Um, I was coaching 12 kids every day all summer long, and uh, it was just super fun. So uh, I coached, coached for that whole summer and then did it the next summer, the summer after that. And 18 years later, I'm just as passionate, just as fired up to do it. Um, obviously, we're not in my parents' backyard anymore. Uh, I see about 500 athletes a day now. So things have scaled a little bit, but um, but the same heart of the camp is there. I just love working with youth, love helping them get faster, stronger, more agile, but also just helping them through the ups and downs of life. That's awesome. And then, so what does what is your faith? Why do you think your faith helped you through the, I guess, getting past that hard part. I mean, obviously you're a fourth grader, so maybe your faith wasn't as strong as it is as it is now, but that grit, I guess, is the best way to use it throughout all of that. I mean, starting your own business is not easy. Why do you think this is something that you were called to? Yeah, great question. Um, so I, I think kind of going into a little bit of my testimony would be helpful. So um, grew up in the church. Um, when I was in seventh grade, I went on a father-son canoe trip with a few of my best friends and their dads. And uh, one of the nights around the campfire, a bunch of our dads were sharing their testimonies. And I kind of realized, like, I don't really have a testimony because I haven't really made this decision to really make Jesus the Lord of my life. And so um, I would say that that was really the time of my life where I was like, no, I'm going to I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to I'm going to live this out. Uh, I'm going to really just believe the gospel. And um, so I made that decision as a seventh grader. That, that trip really kind of helped define for me what a real man is, a real man of God accepts responsibility, rejects passivity, leads courageously, and expects a greater reward. And um, it was good just to kind of have that direction. I was kind of pointed in the direction of like, this is what a real man is. And uh, and then over the next couple of years, went through quite a few trials in the sports world. So I'd already been cut from the team as a young kid, but then also had to deal with, you know, some pretty tough injuries and uh, and stuff like that when I was in high school. And I think a lot of those like trials really just helped helped me to gain perseverance, just like James one says. Um, but it was also just God's way of sharpening me and building character, building resilience, things like that. So, um, yeah, I ended up tearing my abs as a, as a sophomore in high school. And so that was like a ton of physical pain. Um, I guess now I can say that I literally have ripped abs. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the pain of that moment was honestly, it was a lot more emotional pain because, you know, you kind of feel like you're letting your team down whenever you're sidelined and not able to compete. And so, um, yeah, it was, that was, that was just a good time. Honestly, when I, when that season of life kind of got ripped away from me and I wasn't able to compete in sports in the way that I wanted to, um, I, I kind of filled most of my time just by studying the word. Um, and so it was a really good, like growth season for me as a young sophomore in high school. Um, and then continuing, you know, with the uh, pursuing sports and things like that throughout college and uh, and beyond college now still coaching. Um, yeah, God's just taught me so many different things in different seasons and grown me in different areas that, you know, still need to be pruned. So that's awesome. That's a great story. And it's often the worst scenarios that that happened to us in which God uses to grow us closer to him. 
And I think a lot of people could say the same thing. Um, I'm sorry it had to do with physical pain for you, but that is something that you look back at now, <laughs> probably in a positive way in some ways. So, so I have to ask as, as a teenager, as a teenage athlete, yeah. you work with lots of teenagers. Why is it so important for teenagers to express not only by just evangelizing, but act like a Christian on the field and in relationship to, yes, I can do it at school. Yes, I can do it with my family at church, but why is it so important on the field to do that? Mm, yeah, great question. I, I think it's just important everywhere. I mean, it's sports are kind of uh, like a microcosm of life itself. You know, how you act on the field is probably how you're going to be acting at home too. You know, if you, you know, for, for me in this season of life, if I go to the mailbox and I get a bill for something way more than I was expecting and I blow up and I'm super angry or things like that, that's probably the same way I would react if I was playing basketball and the ref makes a really bad call against me, you know? Um, and so like, I don't think that you can separate the two. You can't just like walk in holiness in one area of your life and then just like totally disregard it in another. So, um, part of it is, you know, when you're on the field or on the court and stuff like that, you've got a lot of public eye on you. And I think, um, yeah, really walking the walk, not just talking the talk becomes extra important. Yeah. So what experiences, or I guess, what lessons did you learn from your basketball career and just in general from sports that you think have translated to your life outside of athletics? Mm, great question. Man, my first gut instinct is to probably share some things that I did well and, you know, share some successes or achievements or things like that. But honestly, I look back and I have like several big things that I like kind of regret about those early years. And I feel like it'd probably be better for me to discuss some of those things. So um, one of the big things both. Uh, that I think is pretty cool is that like right around that time of seventh grade, God really gave me a heart, uh, like just this deep desire to really honor the Lord and to make his name known um, among my teammates and even opponents at a young age. Uh, but like I said, there's there's a lot of things I kind of regret about that season. Uh, one of the first things that I would say is uh, I did a terrible job of reading scripture in context. And uh, I kind of have a funny story about this, but it, it it's, it's kind of funny looking back on now at the same time, it's kind of horrific because this is a big deal and it has a lot of implications. So uh, I was going to go on like a youth mission trip with my high school youth group and um you know, our pastor before we left basically gave us this like, you know, kind of sermon type, you know, speech. And he's like, you know, I want our attitude when we go on this trip to be like, you know, get up, let's go. You know, if if you're called to do something, even if it's a dirty, nasty task, you're like, yep, let's go. Uh, let's go. Let's go do this thing. So get up, let's go. That was the going to be the motto of the trip. And uh, I was asked to make T-shirts for the trip. And so on the front of the chest, I put, get up, let's go. And uh, I was like, I, th I think it needs something more. And so I go on to the internet, I go to BibleGateway.com, and I look up, get up, let's go. And I find that exact phrase in Judges chapter 19. And I'm like, sweet, Judges 19, 28, put that on the verse as well. Uh, and so that was like our t-shirt. And we got a bunch of them made, and we're all wearing them. And eventually it was brought to my attention uh, that Judges 19 is really not a great passage to put on a t-shirt. <laughs> um, I'll read it for you here in context. It says, um, when her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's go. There was my quote, but there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he reached home, he took out a knife and cut up his concubine limb by limb into 12 parts and sent them into all the areas of Israel. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I look back and I'm like horrified. I'm like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe I did that. But honestly, at the time, I was just like totally naive to how I should be reading scripture and studying the word and things like that. And so, um, yeah, if I could go back, that's definitely one area that I would really want to grow in. Um, a uh, second one is, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd say I really loved God and those kind of things, but I wasn't, I wasn't really truly abiding in him. I had really weak spiritual disciplines. Um, and that kind of led to a like weak fruitfulness, weak obedience. And so 
you know, John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And um, yeah, I look back and I had a real lack of fruitfulness for several years. Um, yeah, even though I was like really trying, you know, to be fruitful, I wasn't really able to do it on my own. And that's exactly what that verse says. Um, and so I feel like later, just through growth and good mentorship and time in the word and time in prayer, uh, I got a lot of clarity in the gospel, um, really being filled with the Holy Spirit and also just learning how to pray effectively. Those were all really, really helpful things. Um, and then I think the last thing, uh, I know that this is like a, a faith-based, you know, sports podcast. And I think that's awesome. I think one thing that I fell into this trap is, um, I, I kind of segmented the Christian walk a little bit too much, I think, where it was kind of like, oh yeah, we're the Christian athletes and we're over here. Um, but like Paul didn't start the Christian tent maker fellowship, you know, Paul was a tent maker, right? Uh, but really what he did was he built up local churches and he used his work in a way that glorified the Lord. Um, and so like, there's a, there's a really like under the radar little thing that happens in the book of Acts where at one point, um, Paul starts to do life with Priscilla and Aquila who are two other tent makers. Um, it's in the book of Acts and, um, and so, yeah, they're just making tents together. They're doing life together, but ultimately they're still on mission with the, the local church body. And so, um, yeah, in First Thessalonians 4, this has kind of been like a life verse for me for the last few years, um, verses 11 and 12. It says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And um, I think of that verse a lot when I think about like the sports world, because you know, when you're a kid, you're dreaming of the moment of like hitting that buzzer beater shot, like the accolades, the winning the Super Bowl, like those kinds of things. I'm a big March Madness fan. So like, I'm really excited for the next couple of weeks. But like, you know, you can dream about those things. And so much of it can really just stem from selfish ambition. You know, it's like this desire to have your own name be put forth. And um, but yeah, just the importance of working with our hands and making our ambition to lead a quiet life. Like, um Ultimately, it's like it's Jesus that we're seeking to praise, not our own, you know, our own names or things like that. So, yeah, those are things really that I well, feel like I've really grown in some life lessons I've learned more recently to go back and redo stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, that's really well put. You mentioned your mentors, and that's a big part of how you got to this point. Why? Why do you think it's important to have mentors in your life that are helping you and teaching you things that they wish they would have learned? Yeah, Um I feel like plans succeed when you've got an abundance of counselors. And uh, I feel like in every season of life, I've had multiple older men pouring into me, uh, most of which are, you know, 5, 10, 20 years ahead of me in different journeys of life. And so, yeah, when I was in when I was in middle school, I had an incredible uh, track coach uh, and basketball coach. And those guys kind of stayed in contact with me beyond that. So like my middle school uh, track coach became my high school cross country coach later became our premarital counselors when my wife and I got married. So he kind of helped us through a bunch of seasons of life. Um, I've just had other people that like really helped me with the memorization of scripture, uh, pastors that have really invested in me. Um, so yeah, I mean, coaches, pastors, and just really other godly men, things like that, that help refine me. And I think, um, we need that. We need people who are speaking into us, who see our day to day lives. Um, both in church and in work and in home life um, that can speak into us and basically say, Hey, like, you know, you could do this better, you know, offering encouragement here, or rebuking correction here. Like that's an important function of the church body. Yeah. You got to find those people because they prove invaluable. All right. I want to ask you about your time no. on American Ninja Warrior. So a lot of people, I like to call it, and this is for all sports. I like to call it the armchair quarterback syndrome. It's the people that sit there and they watch something happen. They're like, oh, I could do that. Or why would they do that? And that's something, a trap I've fallen into, especially during football season. Why would they call yep. that play? Why would they throw it to that guy? Especially as a Chiefs fan yep. this year. But my question yep. for you is, first off, is it that hard? I think people uh, maybe don't think so. So set the record straight. 
Yeah, great question. Man, I think uh, one of the things that will catch a lot of people off guard is how hard some of those things are to grip. Like, it's one thing to, you know, grab a monkey bar, you know, like, or pull a bar or things like that and hang. But um, a lot of those objects that you see, like, hanging, uh, they're pretty brutal. Whenever you're grabbing a pole vertically uh, or transitioning from one to another, um, that's something that a lot of people just don't have the strength to do. I mean, like, doing j just, just holding on to something like that, as well as, like, those, uh, they call them, like, the cannonballs, you know, where it's like this. It looks like a bowling ball, essentially, but you're grabbing onto it. Those things are pretty tough to grip onto, especially when you're swinging or, like, you're flying through the air to catch it. Um, so, yeah, I would say those things are pretty tough, but it's definitely a skill that can be learned. You know, if if you uh, if you put the work in and stuff like that and you just keep trying and keep failing, you know, you eventually kind of are able to pick it up. So, uh, but it's, a, it's definitely a really fun season, or it was a really fun season, being able to throw your body in the air and you know, run through cool obstacles and stuff like that. I definitely enjoyed it. <laughs> so can you take us behind the scenes? What did training look like? Why did the, op or how did the opportunity present itself? Uh, what was the night like with your family? And I saw that you had your, fa you had some people that you've worked with, especially kids there to, to support you. What was that night like? What was the training up to it? And how did this opportunity present itself? Yeah, so the first year I competed was uh, was super cool. I mean, it was like, I'd never even heard of the show. I, I really wasn't a big TV guy. And so I was coaching camp one day and uh, a young group of like middle school or high school girls came up to me and they're like, hey, Lars, have you heard of American Ninja Warrior? We think you should go compete on it. And then a bunch of the guys were like, yeah, you should do that. And I was like, I've never even heard of this show, but I'll take a look. And uh, it was on that night and I watched and I was like, dude, this looks awesome. Like, this would be so fun. And uh, so I went back to them the next day and I said, if you guys help me make the application video, um, I'll send in the application. And so I did that. Um, and we uh, we made a pretty killer video uh, for my application. And I pretty much knew the moment that like we finished up filming, I was like, I'm getting on this show. <laughs> um, but at the time I was like super naive. I mean, I, I like had no no formal like ninja training like a lot of the people had done a lot of people do like rock climbing go to the like, actual ninja gyms i didn't even know that those were like a thing and so uh, i kind of went into the first one a little bit blind I'd, I'd gotten like a few like ninja type workouts in but not much and um but the actual night was like really cool um i think that there was somewhere between like 200 and 300 kids and their family members that had come out to support and so like it was just like this neon orange stadium and like um yeah, we kind of filled the bleacher section of, of the course. And one of the things that the producer said is they like, you basically get, I think, two or four family members that you can bring in. And uh, and like for me, they made an exception. So they knew that I was going to be one of the first people competing that night. And so they like let everybody like from our group get in. And so it was like this sea of neon orange. It was it was like really cool, really special. I felt so loved by um, by all of like the Ignite athletes and stuff like that that came out to support. So um, didn't make it as far as I would have liked. Um, I kind of got out on a pretty, uh, technical, uh, thing. I was like, I was on the rings and basically long story short, when you're, when you're doing that ring exercise in the years past, all of the pegs were on one side. And so you just kind of like swing side to side. Um, but then the night that I was competing, the, the pegs were on opposite sides. And so you, you kind of have to go through it more like monkey bars, and uh, I just didn't have the technique, and so I didn't make it. But uh, a bunch of us failed that one early, and then as soon as like one person got it and switched up the technique, almost everybody got it throughout the rest of the night. And so, kind of a bummer, but uh, still overall awesome experience and uh, something I'll cherish for a long time. That's incredible. So the question I would like to ask everybody that comes on this show, because I think it's an important question to ask, and you've already alluded to it a little bit. But I wonder if I'm wondering if you could just expound on it a little bit. It, the question is, if there was one thing you could tell your younger self, what would it be with the idea that maybe somebody out there is listening right now that could hear it now and maybe use that in their life? Man, um, the the thing that really comes to mind right now is if you are free in Christ, you're free to lose everywhere else. Um and uh, I think there's a lot of implications to that. 
Um, but basically because God, the father accepts you in Christ, you're free to lose the acceptance of others. You're free to be rejected and betrayed. You're free to be unnoticed and unseen. You know, you're free to be nothing, little, despised, disregarded, dismissed, or devalued, uh, in the eyes of human beings, because ultimately you have God's approval. You have God's, uh, you can rest in God's victory. And so, yeah, I would say if you're free in Christ, you're free to lose everywhere else. That's the, that's like my big motto. I think that I've been resting in for the last uh, last couple of weeks, and I, I wish that was something that I had a, a deeper sense of at a younger age. Well, that's a great way to put it. Thank you, thank you for coming on the show, Lars. Uh, there's one more thing, as we always like to finish our episodes. Um, I'd like if you have a quote of the day, could you give it to? It could be that last thing you just said, but I'd like to end every episode with a quote of the day. Man, my uh, my verse will be uh, James one twenty two. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Um, yeah, I think uh, right now we've gotten really content in a lot of churches where it's like we just go on Sunday and we're spectators. Uh, you know, it's kind of like going to a football game. Nobody's favorite part of a football game is the huddle. Nobody's favorite part of a basketball game is the huddle. And, uh, you know, at some point, you know, when you're – you can't be making, you know, Sunday service just a huddle. It's not just a time to get together. It's a time for strengthening. It's in a time for encouragement, but you got to get out there and really play the game. And uh, so, yeah, James one twenty two. do not make listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Go out there and, and walk the Christian walk in all aspects of life. Well, thank you for coming on, Lars. It's been an incredible episode. Awesome. Thanks so much, Josiah. Appreciate you, brother.